Hello and welcome to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. I'm Dino Varelli, founder and CEO of Project Purple and the host of the Project Purple Podcast. We have another interview for you coming up with a very special guest after a few quick updates. We're already halfway, we're more than halfway actually as we record this. Uh, it's so crazy how fast 2023 has gone. Um, and we're on pace for another record year, which is just amazing. And I just want to thank everyone who has supported, donated, or participated in the Project Purple event to date. Um, as I said, we're seven months in and we're on pace to beat last year, which is our best year ever. Most of our fall marathon teams are full. So I, I, I hate saying this, but uh, you know, if you want to run for us in 2023, uh, the options are, are, are few and far between, which is just amazing. But we still have a couple spots left in our Detroit full half and 5K, along with our Chicago full half marathon and our newly added South Norwalk half marathon and 5K. If you're looking to run any of our other teams, we are building lists for 2024. So um, if you are interested, I would suggest getting on those lists as soon as possible because we do sell out very, very quick. We also have our virtual event, Work Harder, It's Not Chemo, happening here in August, as well as in the Park Ridge, Illinois area, we have our Horner Hustle 5K happening in August. Something locally here to the audience in Connecticut and New England, we're launching a new event, which is our Urban Repel Series Over the Edge in Hartford, Connecticut on September 16th. As we go over the edge, I believe it's 14 stories for Project Purple and raising awareness for pancreatic cancer. To learn more about these great events, visit our website at projectpurple.org and make sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date on all things Project Purple wherever you are on social media, because we are everywhere now, even on TikTok, which is uh, which is pretty crazy. Without further ado, let's meet our special guest today, coming to us all the way from Northern Virginia, Dr. Brittany Smirnoff. Thank you so uh, much for having me on. Thank you for being on the Project Purple podcast. So I know our team connected with you a while back. Um, so it's great to have you here on the podcast. I know. Uh, a little bit about your story, but as we were talking here before we hit record, I don't, we don't really have a script. I always like hearing the story kind of firsthand from our guests, uh, because I think that's where there's like genuine authenticity about my questions and reactions and stuff. I do know some stuff, which is kind of like a scary, as we were playing kind of connect the dots here, it's kind of this real scary parallel to, to individually to my story. Um, but we're going to get into that. And as I said before, we hit record kind of the first segment of our podcast is always our guest opportunity to kind of share with our audience kind of their background, what brings them really to the podcast today. Um, I always kind of preface this by saying, you know, when I hand the mic over to you, you can say as high level as you want, or you can get as deep into the weeds. So with that, uh, Dr. Smirnoff, uh, the microphone is yours to share kind of your journey and how you get to us here on the Project Purple podcast today. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Brittany Smirnov. I'm a dermatologist and I'm 37 years old. I found out that I was BRCA2 positive about four years ago. My son is four and a half and I found about, or my second son is four and a half and I found out about a half a year after he was born. Um, a few things there is that, so I found out basically I was breastfeeding at the time and I had like a lot of bloody discharge, which is one of the signs of breast cancer. And luckily I do not have breast cancer. I was not diagnosed at the time with breast cancer. Um, but I went to a breast surgeon and discussed kind of some of my family history. And my family history is a little bit of a funky story because my grandmother, my on my paternal grandmother, so my dad's mother, was diagnosed with breast cancer at about 32 years old. And wow. so she was extremely young. Um, she had a radical mastectomy at the time. And so this is, we're talking like, um, I want to say it was 1947. So it was a really long time ago. Radical mastectomy on the right side. Um, she even had the pectoralis muscle removed. Um, you get lymph nodes removed when you have that done. Um, and so she was then cancer-free for a long time um, and got a second primary on the other side. And that happened at 72. Um, she had, again, another um, mastectomy on the other side. Um, I'm sorry, not a mastectomy, a lumpectomy, forgive me. And then at 74, she um, started having 
symptoms. And it turned out that she had what we suspect is metastasis to the brain um, that resulted in a cerebral hemorrhage. And then she uh, passed away from that. So a stroke and and died from that stroke. Um, So she had uh, two primary breast cancers and then a recurrence that eventually led to her death. That she had three sons, um, one of those being my father. And because BRCA tends to go a little bit more undetected in men, and because those cancers tend to show up a little bit later in life, no one ever thought anything of it. And I tell this kind of long winded story because when I went to my breast surgeon, I was breastfeeding at the time, and I said, Listen, this is a, a this weird history I just have, it's kind of remote, but I don't have any other females in that lineage that have come of age to get breast cancer yet. Um, And so he pitched the idea, listen, let's not stop you breastfeeding to do an MRI unless we'll just test you for a genetic mutation. If you're positive, we can always stop breastfeeding. We can check an MRI so that we get kind of more specific data, more reliable information. Um, And so we decided to go ahead and check me. Um, I obviously came back positive. So I was BRCA2 positive um, and was referred to a genetic oncologist. So um, at the time I lived in South Florida and there is a fantastic place in Boca Raton called the Lynn Cancer Center. And they have a specific subdivision just dedicated to um, genetic oncology. So, So inherited kind of cancers. And I went there and they were not positive or super convinced that that mine couldn't be a false positive given the remote history. So they retested me. I was again positive. Um, so just confirming that my BRCA2 was in fact um, mutated. Um, I, at that time, was not necessarily ready to do anything other than I stopped breastfeeding. I got my MRI. It came back clear and MRIs are very, very sensitive. So it would have picked up something at the time, at least that's the hope, if I had breast cancer. Um, And I did know that I was positive, so I told my father, who, um, again, the assumption is that I got it from my father. And so eventually, uh, we did find out that that that's the case. But at the time, he refused to get tested. He kind of wasn't really interested um, because he said things that I assume most men have said at some point in their lives, I'm not worried about it. I don't have breasts. I'm not, it's not going to affect me. I don't have ovaries. It's not a big deal. Um, And that I think was tough because I, you can push only so hard when it comes to your father, you know, I'm not his doctor I'm his, I'm his daughter. And so I, I kind of pushed to just get tested. We know you're positive. Let's at least do some monitoring. And I told him about pancreatic cancer, but again, the rate in, um, even BRCA2 positive persons is only about 7%. So it's not huge. It's just very increased compared to the average population. Um, and at one point, he was then diagnosed with diabetes. Um, and there have been some studies showing that in BRCA2 positive individuals who have like a new diagnosis of diabetes or a change in blood sugar levels like hyperglycemia, that there's an increased risk of or an increased likelihood of pancreatic cancer. And so we usually can use that as kind of an early detection sign. And I encouraged him to get screened and tested and and checked out. Um, And again, he's a guy, so he refused. Um, And about, I want to say about 12 months after that, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, And so my father, which it sounds like yours, um, lived quite a while with his diagnosis, and and so did mine. So that's one of the other benefits of BRCA two positive pancreatic cancer. It tends to be a a little bit more responsive to some of the chemotherapies and immunotherapies out there, and b it tends to um, take a little bit longer versus regular pancreatic cancer that's not BRCA two mutations. So my father survived seventeen months with his diagnosis, and then eventually passed away um, in February of this year of 2023. So, and part of what um, I think caught the attention of your staff is that I myself, I'm BRCA2 positive. Um, I recently underwent a prophylactic double mastectomy. And I chose to do that because um, everyone in the world has very differing opinions on risk tolerance. And for me as a physician, my risk tolerance is pretty low. I want to be able to control the playing cards that I'm dealt. I want to try and take 
the reins as often as I can. And so I thought it's going to be much easier on myself, my family, my patients, if I schedule time off and do this before waiting for a diagnosis to hit me. And um, so that double mastectomy was about three weeks ago, um, just shy of three weeks ago. So it was very recent, which is why I have time to be on the podcast today. <laughs> um, so I am still in the process of recovery. Um, in Israel, where the BRCA2 mutation is very, very popular, uh, not popular, prevalent, I, I apologize, mm -hmm. um, it's much less popular to undergo double mastectomy prophylactically. There, they tend to choose um, watching and waiting and, and surveillance. And so um, the nice thing is that even if your risk tolerance is much higher and you do not mind getting a diagnosis of breast cancer in your life, as long as you know that you're a mutation carrier um, and you do the screening that's recommended, your mortality, meaning how long you live, is unchanged. As long as you do the Q6 month screening or the double mastectomy, I mean, the survival is the same, basically. So, And that's for people who know and adhere to the screening guidelines. And so I think that's something that people who are intimidated or scared by the idea of a double mastectomy prophylactically can hold on to, that even if they do get breast cancer, it tends to be very early um, and very treatable at that time. Wow. Sorry, I know that was a lot of information. No, but that, that, was, that, that was great. So I have so many questions here. <laughs> okay. So it, it's so fascinating to me when you talk about your grandmother that, you know, we go back to 1947 and, you know, this was before there was genetic testing clearly. Right. And, and, and you have such a long gap from 47 to the, when she becomes 72 that it, she didn't have a reoccurrence. Like, you know, there were, I mean, maybe there were issue, other issues, you know, related possibly, but, you know, again, in 47, and I, I think, I mean, germline testing for pancreatic cancer didn't become kind of a guideline until I think like 2019, maybe 2018, possibly like across the board, right? Like it was done at major cancer centers because that, you know, of academia, that's what they did. But, you know, now and I guess I preface this in air quotes here, regardless of where you go in the United States, like if you go to, you know, a, com a community hospital or a regional hospital, you should get germline tested if you have pancreatic cancer, right? Like that's the NIH guideline. You know, looking back though, that wasn't the case. And I, I can see, you know, it, like the, the, the other piece here, like when you asked your dad to get the testing and I, I, I think you said, the, the quote was here, like, well, I don't have to worry about breast cancer, right? And I think that's one thing that, like, is so powerful that, like, in, in, in saying this is, like, yes, men can get breast cancer. We know that. It is a very small percentage. But there are so many other cancers related to BRCA. But the BRCA community has done, and kudos to them, as we mentioned before we hit record, you know, my mom's a breast can two-time breast cancer survivor. She's a BRCA positive, you know, and they've done amazing things with breast cancer, right? Like they've been at this thing in BRCA with breast cancer for over 10 years, at least, um, you know, whereas in pancreatic, I think really over the last like four years, really five years, we've seen kind of like, you know, an emphasis there. And now actually, as we've progressed here, the last two years, I've, we've seen more and more, there's more being done, there's more awareness to it. But, you know, prior to this, you know, back in, you know, 2019, you know, I think people really didn't associate BRCA with a lot of other things other than breast cancer, because there was so much being done for breast cancer. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think denial is a, a complex issue because part of it is that, you know, if, if a person like my father admits that that he has the mutation, then then you're saying that he gave it to me, and then all of these risks associated. So it's it's a little bit easier to just say, hey, I don't have any of these risk factors. It's it's not a big deal. Um, yeah. And and again, I I kind of kicked myself because I also pushed for him to get uh, pancreatic imaging done, and I probably did that about five or six times before I just gave up because I wasn't making any headway. And I always wonder if you pushed harder, if you if you kind of, I don't know, 
plead with them more or something along those lines, would that have made a difference? And I honestly do not know. Um, because as you are aware, sometimes pancreatic cancer, if caught early enough, and especially if in the tail of the pancreas or an operable site, um, you can have a Whipple procedure and be cured from that cancer. Um, that's that's not the commonality. I mean, that's that's the exception to the rule, not the rule itself, but it still always makes you wonder. So now you also said, though, and, and hindsight's always twenty twenty. and I know before we hit record, like you got into dermatology because of your dad, right? Like because of the, yes. the, the so let's talk a little bit about that because that does play into this, um, you know, which we'll talk about here in a second. So why did you get into dermatology and why in that specific field? Yeah. So excellent question for me. Um, dermatology, I grew up watching my father, um, get skin cancers diagnosed and treated uh, throughout his entire life. So my father was an Irishman who grew up in California and surfing in the 60s and 70s. And by the time of his death, he had had, you know, probably around two to 300 skin cancers diagnosed, treated. Um, and again, all of these can be treated very easily for the most part, as long as they're detected early. Um, and so I saw him kind of going through all of this but yet still with a smile, still looking forward to seeing his physician. And so I thought if you can be the type of physician who really changes and saves and influences positively somebody's life, but patients look forward to seeing you and you get that longitudinal relationship of you get to know them very well. You get to see them every day, every, not every day, but every few months or every year. And over time, these, these people become very close to you. And so um, my Father was very close with his dermatologist. His dermatologist um, is a guy named Dr. Martin Braun, who had a son named Dr. Marty Braun, and all the whole family are dermatologists. Um, and they became mentors of mine, and I eventually went into the field. Um, I also did two years in research at the National Institutes of Health um, in melanoma immunology research. Uh, and so there I got a little bit more of a purview into the kind of the aggressiveness of melanoma. Um, and I thought, this is the kind of physician that I'd like to be. And for the most part, I practice medical dermatology. Um, and that just means skin cancer detection, the treatment of things like psoriasis and eczema, acne, and rosacea. Um, and so I focus a lot on, on A, making skin more healthy, and B, detecting skin cancer as early as possible. Um, and part of my passion is actually BRCA2 positive individuals, BRCA positive individuals, I usually take a pretty thorough history. And if there's anything that raises red flags as far as this person should be genetically tested, I bring that up with them. So I try to be as active a proponent of genetic testing and finding these things out as early as possible because knowledge is power. And, you know, if we can diagnose one or two people in our careers and save their lives accordingly, then I think that's a, a fantastic thing. And and I credit the first breast surgeon um, that I saw that pushed through and, and tested me with my, you know, knowledge and my survival and my ability to continue. Such a powerful couple of statements there. Um, and, you know, we've always said here on the podcast, that's one of the reasons why we do this is to share that knowledge and to give people, you know, hopefully that inspiration to advocate for themselves. So a couple of questions that just came up. So. Do you think one right off the the top here because it's it's so uh, on the tip of my tongue? Do you think if you didn't go to that doctor and someone who was just and I'm not trying and, and don't take any disrespect to anyone listening or to you here, uh, a doctor that was more like laissez faire in the sense like hey you know let's just wait this out it's not that big of a deal or hey I've seen this it's just not not anything to be alarmed about do you think you would have continued to push or adhere by that advice to not, not worry? So, I mean, I, I personally think I would have continued to push, but that's me. I'm a physician. So I know really how to be an advocate. Um, but aside from that, I had been gaslit by the medical profession before as well. I, you know, when I, the first time I said, look, my grandmother had breast cancer at 32 years old, I was told I'm wrong. Like, I just, I can't be correct. Nobody gets breast cancer at 32. And I'll, all I could think was, well, we know that that's not true. Um, yeah. And so I think that, that 
obviously, we never want to say that anyone is gaslit in the medical community, but but it happens. And and this physician did the opposite. He listened to my concerns and really kind of worked with me um, to kind of get to the bottom of what was going on. And so um, would I have continued to push? I think so. But I am also thankful that I didn't meet resistance with this physician. So it was fantastic. And I keep referring to him as a physician because right now I can't recall his name. So I'm going to look it up and get it back to that's all right. That's all right. So this is a this is an interesting point here that I want to kind of because this comes up often. And I want to ask you the question, and maybe we'll spend a, a minute or two on this subject because I think it's an important one. You you talk about being gaslit. My question then, first question is, do you think that the system, and and it's not necessarily the doctors, but the system is just that is the way the system system works in terms of and how what do I mean by when I'm saying that with insurance schooling it's a numbers game so everyone has to see in order to hit their numbers in order to you know keep a business going they have to see a certain amount of patients so there's only a certain amount of time that clinicians have with each individual person so there's like these 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 things from outside of their control, from a physician's control, a clinician's control that are already in place that make it really difficult for a clinician to maybe think outside the box. And not to say that that, you know, we're talking about like clinicians being robots or, you know, that they don't think outside the box, but there's these systemic things that are in play, like schooling, like certain marks that you know at a hospital or if you whatever system if you're in private practice like you have like it's a numbers game you have to see as many people possible and and also there's also a lot of sick people right so i think clinicians are also trying to in a well-intentioned way trying to see everyone right as quickly as possible so it's kind of this double edge right like yes like there is a system where like you have to see that many patients because of insurance or Medicaid or how things are built. But then also there's this huge demand, right? It's there's this huge demand because we have so many sick patients. So do you think then, I guess then I'll rephrase the question. Is it like a systemic issue or is it just a training issue in terms of clinicians, not necessarily always like patients have to be like their biggest advocate. Cause if you don't ask, you don't get yeah, so um, I think both both issues. So number one is that I think that the training has really, really changed in the way in in the medical profession over the last twenty to twenty five years. I mean, so the way that I was trained, and I finished residency uh, about seven years ago. So the way that I was trained was what we call shared decision making. You really talk with a patient, you present all the options, you kind of talk through things. Um, And I think that that is the new wave of medicine, but there's still a lot of clinicians out there who um, are rushed by the system or who who have a hard time believing that a, a person could be diagnosed. And, you know, as we said, 1947 with breast cancer at the age of 34, I think some of these things, um, are, you know, as we know, gaslighting exists in the medical community. It just, it does, unfortunately. Um, And I think it's a mix of patient or physicians that might be busy, physicians that might not necessarily have the time, um, but also physicians that have seen people who have been, have misrepresented information in the past. And so I think um, it's, it's not super straightforward, but I would say that I am very thankful for the physicians that do not do that. I hope and pride myself in being one of the patient, the physicians that listens to people. Um, and and I think that it's only improving with time. So that's the really cool thing is I think the training really goes into shared decision making with patients and kind of involving them in the process and really understanding and listening to them. I mean, that's, again, all within a very short period of time because of the pressures of insurance companies kind of dictate that our patient visits are shorter and shorter and shorter. So it's really hard to connect in quite the same way. But I think the good doctors out there will always try. Yeah. And I I think 
the information you just gave out is so powerful, right? I, the, venues like this to, to share with an audience to say like, Hey, like if you have questions or being your advocate or, or having those discussions, having those healthy conversations, even if it is that short window of time, making sure that you feel comfortable and that your doctor's answering all those questions that you may have coming from a doctor saying that like, Hey, this is what I do. Like, so people need to go. So for the audience watching and listening, like find a doctor that does this, right? I mean, I, I, I mean, I know I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but like, I think that's, I always say to, to patients, like there's so many oncologists out there now that specialize in pancreatic cancer. Like if you don't find one that you don't feel a hundred percent comfortable with go somewhere else. Absolutely. You're the paying customer. It's like, if you go to a restaurant and like your dish comes out cold, like you either leave or you ask for another dish. Like it's the same thing with healthcare. Like if you don't feel comfortable like go somewhere else. And I know like that's, I, I'm not joking when I say that I'm being serious. And I know for some people like, Hey, if you live in like a rural part of the country and that center is the only center that is within like a hundred miles. Well, guess what? There's plenty of groups like project purple, like pan can, um, less garden. There's so many groups in this space that will help you get to another center. Um, and there's even groups without outside of the space that can help you get to a major cancer center uh, or a regional cancer center, um, if that is the case as well. So um, I, I think, you know, sharing that is so powerful, Dr. Smirnoff, because I think there are there are so many amazing doctors, um, but just like any profession, there are some that aren't really as good as as others. And I think being able to share stories like yours um, you know, having, you know, uh, the empowerment to the patient to have those conversations with their doctors is so critical and so key in doing that. Absolutely. And I always say that finding the right doctor or finding the right therapist is like finding the right spouse. I mean, you're yeah. going to find some duds first and eventually you'll find someone that clicks, but it's not, it's not as straightforward as the first person that you meet is going to be the best person for you or the best physician for you or the best therapist or the best husband or wife. And so we need to advocate for ourselves. We need to listen to ourselves. If we don't feel comfortable in a situation, find someone that you do feel comfortable with so that you can talk about the difficult subjects. It's a great analogy. So I, I, going back to your dad, um, you mentioned the skin cancer, which motivated you to, to become, go into dermatology, medical dermatology. Do you, when you got his BRCA diagnosis, I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But like you look back, did the light bulb go off and like, were you like, oh my God? Um, they were all almost exclusively squamous cell carcinomas, which are a, kind of a different beast altogether. Um, right. He also had basal cell carcinomas, which are, again, the, you know, they're kind of a, a lower level skin cancer, but, you know, we treat them and, and they're still very important to treat, but they're, you know, UV related. So sun exposure related. Um, I do think, and again, this is just kind of something in the back of my mind, but I think that with all of these mutations, we are going to find that there are so many associations. And mm -hmm. so do I think that the the astronomical rate of skin cancer that he had is related to his mutation? Yes. Has it been proven in the data and literature that squamous cell carcinoma is a result of a BRCA2 mutation? No, not at all yet. Um, so could there be something there? Perhaps, but I think that the data will have to show us. And one of the really cool things, so my husband is um, a data scientist and, and really interested in AI and, and that kind of thing. And, and one of the fascinating things that's coming out of AI is understanding protein folding. Um, and so my hope is that AI will do things like help us figure out some of the mutations that we have not yet identified. Um, so, because we know there's BRCA2, there's tons of different BRCA mutations in BRCA2 and BRCA1, um, but there are also other mutations out there. And so I think I think part of that space in science is going to be really exciting going forward. And hopefully all we do is learn more. I hope you're right. And I hope it, I, well, I shouldn't say hope. I know you're right. Cause I think we've seen that already, right? Like with, with data, I mean, data proves everything. Right. Um, and it's just a matter. I think there's a there's just mountain and huge amounts of data, which I think for the, for the non medical person or non clinician or someone who's ever had to, you know, or been in any of those meetings or, you know, for the average Joe that, that hasn't been touched by the data part of it. I mean, it, it, it's kind of, 
it can give you a little, it gives me a little bit of a headache, you know, thinking about it because there's so much data, but if we could have a way where AI figures it out, because I do believe, I mean, in my 13 years of doing this, almost 14, like I've met families, like I know one family, they have had six relatives with pancreatic cancer and they do germline testing. There's not, there's, it's, you know, they're, the, they're in this other box, right? Like it's this undefined significance, which again, data, you know, I'm sure there's other families throughout the world that are probably in that same boat, but they just don't have the data to correlate or the the gene that's been identified yet. And I do think that, you know, we're in a really cool time with technology that hopefully within the next five years, you know, everyone can get screened if they have these cancers and hopefully something can be identified. And then we can work on therapies a lot quicker to, like you said before, there is a, there is a therapy within the BRCA pancreatic cancer patients that does do relatively well and does buy them some extra time. Um, it doesn't work great for everyone, but it, it's a great start. It's a lot better where we were 10 years ago or even 15, 20 years ago, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, I mean, that's, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I was going to say that's the case with um, melanoma too. Melanoma, even 15 years ago, would have been a diagnosis that that you would I mean, you still dread it, of course, but it would have been a terminal diagnosis in so many ways. And now we have so many immunotherapies, we have so many things to treat. And so I think as this, as we continue um, in science and in time, we will only improve our treatment and our diagnosis. And obviously, part of it is finding the people who need to be appropriately screened and tested for some of these genetic conditions. And so that's one of the small things that I try and do every day is just when you're talking to patients, figure out, do they have these red flags that might indicate that they should be tested? Um, and so every time I see one or two red flags, I usually have a very open discussion saying, listen, I'm going to talk to you about genetic cancers because of your history and what you do with that information is obviously up to you. And then I usually encourage them to get genetically tested. And quite a few have come back positive, which is, um, uh, I think, fantastic and terrible at the same time, because it's fantastic to have that information and terrible to have that diagnosis. Um, but still knowing, I think, is so much better than not. Knowledge is power. And it's interesting. So there's a book, uh, I believe the gentleman was at Yale, Vincent Avila, I think it was his name, is The Death of Cancer. And I believe that's correct. Um, I don't think I have the book here in my studio, but he was at the NIH. And, and you know, you're mentioning of melanoma, right? And, you know, the, where I'm going with this is just this correlation. And people ask me this question all the time. And I just love to get your feedback, which I think you mentioned some of it already. But, you know, you look at cancers like a melanoma. Like 30 years ago, that was a really bad diagnosis. Hodgkin's lymphoma was another one, right? Like lymphoma, you know, was a really bad diagnosis. Now, fast forward to where we are today, these are, you know, manageable cancers, right? So, um, and this book talks about like the death of cancer and that aspect of the comparison of where we were, you know, 30, 40 years ago and where we are today. And I know that doesn't, Hey, listen, that's not going to bring my dad back. It's not going to bring your dad back. And, and for those people fighting right now, it probably doesn't give them any comfort in that sense. But if you look over the long term, uh, the last 30 years, we have made significant progress. We just have to continue to push for that, right? Like we need to make sure that, you know, research is still conducted. Things that you just mentioned, you know, knowing your genetic risk is, is, is a game changer and can be a game changer for a lot of people because, um, if you know you have one of these genetic mutations, you can get into a lot of these screening and surveillance programs. And like you said before, getting a stage one cancer to a stage four cancer is a really big difference, especially with pancreatic cancer, because you do become operable. So given all that I've just said, given that you're in the medical field, uh, the research you've done and in, in, you're in you know, your space, what do you think from a macro perspective? Just from where you've been, like, hey, you lost your dad to pancreatic cancer. You dealt with that. You have the BRCA diagnosis. Where, if I gave you a blank checkbook, where would you put resources and energy and effort into getting better at this thing? And, and 
we can stay in the pancreatic cancer space or, you know, we can go a little bit broader and just cancer as a whole. Yeah. So, um, I think, I think if I was going to have a blank check, I would probably, I don't know if I'm allowed to split it, but I would probably split it into number one, um, getting people tested, genetically tested, um, that are at risk. And so identifying and testing those patients, um, at no cost to themselves, um, and number two, to, to work on kind of figuring out all of the genetic mutations out there. Um, so, and I think that some of that money could be put towards, like I said, AI, um, figuring out some of these genetic mutations in, in unknown. So if you have a hereditary line, for example, the people with pancreatic cancer throughout the, their lineage, um, you can focus and, and really try and elucidate the mutations that are responsible for those things. Um, and then. Obviously, I think the big the big wave is immunotherapy. Um, mm-hmm. And as we are figuring out immunotherapies for different cancers, I think they're in a in a really cool futuristic world, you would find exactly what mutation is responsible for a cancer, and then you could kind of figure out or plug into a system what immunotherapy is going to be most effective at targeting that specific mutation or that specific cancer. Um, and I think that with advances in AI, that's not that's not so impossible. I think that that could be something that happens in the next 20 or 30 years. And I, and I think that that would be extremely exciting. It's a great time. I think we're going to see some major advancements over the next, like to your point, 20 years, like we'll look back and we'll kind of scratch our heads on why it didn't happen sooner, um, you know, potentially with, with some of these things. I've got a couple of questions here left for you, and then we're going to share uh, where our audience can connect with you. My first one here, again, coming from your background on, you know, where you are and, and even dealing with your patients, you think there are things that we can do to prevent, or I shouldn't say prevent, because I don't know if cancers are necessarily preventable because if you have a genetic risk, right? Like the odds are like your, your percentages go up, but I guess, are there things that we can do as, and we'll stay within the genetic space to lessen our risk of developing cancers? Could that be diet? Could it be exposure? You mentioned your dad, right? Like he was a surfer, Irish guy, never really wore sunscreen and look what happened. Um, so do you think there's things for people that have a genetic risk, because we've been talking about that, um, that they can do from a dietary, from an environmental standpoint, exposure standpoint to prevent cancers arising? So absolutely. And I'll talk about um, a practical, functional kind of data-driven space. And then I will talk about a hypothetical space where I think that just general healthy living is something that we should all strive for. So so from kind of data and information um, for cancers like melanoma. So we know that BRCA2 mutants have an increased risk of melanoma. So we can wear sunscreen. We can protect, wear you know, UV protective shirts. You can avoid um, activities during peak hours when you are unprotected in the sun. Now, I'm not saying avoid the sun. I love being outside. I just wear tons of sunscreen. I wear my big floppy hats and I wear rash guards that cover my entire arms. When I'm driving in the car, I wear those little gloves that look very nerdy, but um, I think they make me look like a cool race car driver. Um, <laughs> the speed that I'm going does not reflect that at all, obviously. <laughs> but but so there are things that we can do to mitigate risk. Um, from so I know we know that from a melanoma perspective, from a breast cancer perspective, the the risks that kind of lead into it. Um, a lot of times, if you are talking about things like taking uh, exogenous hormones that can affect breast cancer risk, and I don't want to talk too much about this because it's not my personal space of mm-hmm. expertise. Um, but, you know, for example, birth control, while it can decrease your risk of ovarian cancer or suppress re- ovarian cancer risk, it can um you know, minutely increase breast cancer risk sometimes. And so these are just things that need to be discussed with a physician and balanced. Um, And then I'll talk a little bit more in the hypothetical space. And that I think kind of speaks to pancreatic prostate. Um, And so 
prevention wise, I think if we eat healthy, clean diets, we cook our own food, we eat clean, exercise regularly. I think that these things are contributory to healthy living. And I think the more we find out in science, the or the more research that we do, the more information that we have, the more we will find out that, you know, a healthy diet and taking care of ourselves in those ways really does help mitigate our risk. Um, and again, there's no solid science there quite yet, but there's a lot of people working on it. Um, I know when I was at the NIH, there was a, a principal investigator, a PI, the head of a lab who uh, his father had early onset Alzheimer's. And so he was studying all of these ways to mitigate the risk of Alzheimer's onset. And so I think that there's a lot here to be learned um, about clean and healthy living and how it can prevent our risk. And if you, we know that we have these risks, um, obviously uh, surveillance is going to be really key. Um, but if you know that you have these risks anyway, just try and take as good care of yourself as you possibly can. Yeah, it's such a powerful statement. And I think uh, going back to what you said, knowledge is power, right? Like if you you know you have these risks, it's kind of like you're 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 playing with fire in a sense. Like if you're not living a healthy lifestyle, and I'm not saying everyone needs to go out and train for a marathon, but there are steps, right? Like, you know, what like you said, eating quality foods at home versus, you know, fast food or, you know, sodas, cigarettes, alcohol, right? Like things that we all know um do not do any good by ingesting large quantities of them. Exactly. Second piece to that, given what you've gone through, what advice would you give for someone who, and, and this is two pronged, because I, you know, as I said before, we hit record, like I was against getting tested for the B, the BRCA. So first question to that is like, what advice would you say to someone who, you know, may have a family history? of BRCA, but is hesitant on getting tested? So my first very practical advice, and this sounds so silly, but get your life insurance policy in place before you get tested or your disability insurance in place before you get tested. If you have, like, if you think that you could have this mutation before you go and get anything on paper, I would just make sure you have policies in place because afterwards they're extremely expensive. Um, and, uh, I, I don't want to sound like I'm scamming the system. I just mean once you once that cat is out of the bag, once that once you know that information, it's much much harder to get covered. But um, and I would say that that know or have an idea of what you're going to do with that information. Um, and even if you're terrified, I think having that information can be totally life changing. Because a lot of people put off getting a mammogram because the idea of breast cancer is so scary, but that doesn't make the risk go away. So knowing your risk is so much more important than living in fear that you may have this risk. Um, and so I would say if you need a little motivation, you can always reach out to me. Um, I can always talk to you. I, I had a wonderful person reach out to me the other day and just say, Hey, I've had breast cancer twice. And my first was when I was 34 years old and I've never been genetically tested. Should I? And I said, yes, please absolutely advocate for yourself because you would be shocked. And it's not, it's not like negligence necessarily. It's that either the testing wasn't as popular at that time, or they didn't do it for everyone, but there are constantly advances and absolutely just if you think that you are one of these people that falls into a high risk category, I would just get checked. So powerful. So leading into that next question of mine, do you think being a doctor, given your medical training, and, and I'm just going to throw this out there, do you think knowing too much can be a challenge? And where I go with that is like with your doc, with your dad, right? Like you, you're not in that space, but you know enough. And then naturally with your own BRCA diagnosis, like, you know, as much as the clinician probably treating you or the, you know, the, uh, the geneticist also, you know, giving you the, uh, the results or giving you advice or what, you know, what to do. Do you think that's a detriment or it's a positive? I think with everything, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, um, I, 
if my dad had listened to me and gotten his screening and maybe we would have saved his life, I would have said that's the coolest thing ever. Um, but, you know, knowledge is only what you do with it. And so for me, with my knowledge of my diagnosis, I decided that I was going to mitigate my risk in the best way that I knew how. And the beautiful thing is that because I'm a part of the medical community, I have so much faith in the medical community. I have some of the best surgeons and the best oncologists, and I have a gynecologic oncologist. And I have, I mean, I have a team of people looking out for me and taking care of me. But also because of what I know and because things like ovarian cancer can be so aggressive and so detrimental. And so um, I got I got to plan all of my surgeries or my risk reduction reduction surgeries. And so my next plan will actually be to to do um a new phorectomy because that will also mitigate ovarian cancer risk and fallopian tube cancer risk. And so I I think that that knowing these things is a huge blessing. I think knowing too much is sometimes tough because when you're going into a surgery and you know exactly what's going to happen to you, it sometimes can be a little bit unsettling. But I have absolute faith in the physicians that I've chosen and they have served me so well and so carefully. And so um, I would say find a doc that you believe in or find a panel of doctors that you believe in and work with them and have faith in them to take good go care back of you. To what you said though, knowledge is power. So I think like the knowledge that you know, um, and you said this multiple times, this risk mitigation, right? Like there's risk and reward. So we do know like, yeah, there's a risk to having this gene. And if you can eliminate that risk, right? That's a sound decision. And the and everyone has to make their own decision, right? Like, I, I guess we're not trying to advocate here that everyone go down a similar path. Everyone has to make that decision for them. But again, going back to knowledge is power, like knowing that risk, like you're, or knowing those, those risk factors of not having a surgery or having the surgery. And then everyone can make kind of their own educated decision, what's best for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yeah, so I also say that when you're looking at statistics, so the statistics are extrapolated from from populations, from huge numbers of people. Um, but if we are looking at, let's just take my family, for example. So there's a, lots of members of my family that I didn't, don't want to mention on the podcast, but that have been positive and been found to have cancer. And so um, in my family, the rate of breast cancer in the females that carry my mutation um, is, is nearly 100%. So by the age of 43. So every person carrying the BRCA2 mutation in my family has um, has gotten breast cancer by about 43 years old. And so, so if you are trying to calculate your own specific risk, you can look at numbers, but you also have to look within your own family what has happened within your own family because um, BRCA2 is a, a big gene and it can be mutated in a bunch of different locations and that will convey different risks accordingly. And so you just have to look at your own family risk too and how you feel about that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I made the right decision or didn't make the right decision. I I have no comment. I made the right decision for me. But if other people want to do that or don't, just know that that as long as you know that you um, have that mutation that you can decide and it's still your mortality. Like I said, how long you live sh should remain the same, even if you do get breast cancer. It, it's so powerful though. I, I mean, not to sound like a broken record here, but like just hearing you talk about that decision-making progress though, there's a lot of knowledge in that. Right. And so that's how, I mean, I would hope and, you know, that a lot of people, whether it's pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, BRCA, you know, make these decisions. I, I, I think like this overarching theme here on this whole conversation has been, you know, that empowerment of knowledge and how important that is in these decisions and in these decision-making processes that patients and advocates should go through when they meet with hopefully doctors like yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and all of this is really scary. So it's okay to talk and to admit that it is very scary to go into these things and to think about them and to process them. But it's a lot easier when you talk through people who have been through it themselves, who have had those diagnoses or, and I think that, that 
like I said, finding someone that you feel comfortable with or, or a mentor or something, I have found that extremely helpful um, to connect with other people in the BRCA community, um, to connect with other people that have been through mastectomies, to connect with other people that have been through losing a father to pancreatic cancer. All of these things are powerful and it makes you feel like you're not alone. Um, and it also makes you feel um, like you can mentor other people through this one day if you can get through this, which we all we all do. So powerful. My last question here, and this is always a loaded question, Brittany, um, and there's no right or wrong to this. Given your experience, what you've gone through, um, how do you define the term pancreatic cancer? Huh. That's an interesting question. So, so um, pancreatic cancer, I think that at its very basis would just be um, a mutation in pancreatic cells that continues to grow and form a tumor and take over the pancreas. Um, that can be, uh, because pancreatic cancer can be caused by different genetic mutations, that can be very aggressive. That can be a little bit less aggressive depending on the type. But um, in general, I would say pancreatic cancer is probably one of the worst cancers that we face. Um, and the more we can learn about it, the better we will be kind of prepared uh, to treat our patients, to treat ourselves, to treat our family. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. But Perfect. It's perfect. There's no right or wrong. It's, it's given what you've gone through in, in your experience. Sure. Our last thing here uh, for our audience listening or watching at home, if they want to connect, uh, maybe someone might have a question for you, uh, but they want to connect with you online, uh, where's the best place for them to do that? So I would say um, Instagram is probably the easiest and best. Um, my Instagram handle is at dr underscore S-M-I-R-N-O-V. So that's at dr underscore Smirnov. Um, and you can message me there. I would be happy to get back to you. I will clarify one thing. Please don't send me pictures of rashes. I will not give <laughs> medical advice over the over Instagram, but I will happily help guide you in the right direction if you need to find a good dermatologist or if you need, you know, just a little mentorship or anything. I'm I'm happy to help. Well, awesome. Uh, Dr. Smirnoff, thank you for being a guest on the Project Purple podcast. Uh, for sharing your journey with pancreatic cancer and also inspiring our audience um, about your BRCA journey as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. If you like today's episode, please share this episode and follow the Project Purple Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. That is a wrap of another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. Thanks for listening. And until next time, please be safe. Bye.